It's possible his heart rate was going over 200 beats a minute. Fluid was filling slowly his lungs. He's lost through this entire ordeal a tremendous amount of blood. From the whipping and scourging that took place before the crown of thorns set on his head, nails driven through his wrists, nicking arteries and veins, and, and his body is going into shock. His arteries and veins are constricting. He has dangerously low blood pressure. Adrenaline is kicking in, and his heart can't take it. His body is failing. John's Gospel tells us about the fifth word of Jesus from the cross. And it's a little surprising that it's John that tells us this story, this, this word, because of who Jesus is. And one of the, the, the great themes in the Gospel of John is that Jesus is this never-ending supply, that Jesus fulfills our needs and more. Right? It's John that tells us. He's the only Gospel writer that tells us that Jesus' first miracle was going to this wedding in Canaan where they ran out of wine. And so Jesus had them fill these enormous stone jars holding 20 to 30 gallons of water. These enormous stone jars, six of them, had them fill them up with water. And then in some way, at some point, Jesus transformed all of them into wine so that the party could continue. Jesus is this never-ending supply, right? It's John who tells us that Jesus once met this Samaritan woman by a well and says to her that if he asked, or she asked him, he could supply living water and she wouldn't have to keep coming back to the well every day for a drink. He says to a crowd of people once in the Gospel of John, whoever believes in me, streams of living water will flow. And John, like the other Gospels, tell us that time that Jesus fed 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. But John is the only one who tells us that the next day, Jesus preached a message to those same people and told them that his body and his blood would be their food that would satisfy them forever if they would only take the faith and the, and the trust and the risk to eat it to take it, to receive it. Jesus is this never-ending supply, God providing for us in the Gospel of John. So it's surprising that John is the one who tells us that Jesus says from the cross, his body is failing, and he admits it by saying very simply, I'm thirsty. The one who has provided and provided and given and given for so many all this time is now exhausted. The supply is running out. His life is being poured out. In fact, John will tell us later after Jesus dies that one of the Roman soldiers takes a spear and sticks it up into Jesus' side. And out of Jesus' side, blood and water flow. The one who gave and gave and gave and promises living water, streams of living water, is now in need. He is now empty. He is now exhausted. Now, we generally don't like stories like that. We don't like stories about needy people. We don't like stories about exhausted people, about empty people. We want to hear stories of people who overcome their limitations. We want to hear stories about people who, who worked hard and struggled and strived and got up every morning and, and went to bed late and, and worked hard and overcame all the obstacles that they had, overcame their limitations. These self-determined people who are our role models, these people that we want to follow, these people who make us want to strive for greatness, we read their stories, we watch their stories in film, we, we celebrate them, we want to be like them. And maybe the reason we, we do that, maybe the reason we celebrate those kinds of stories is we really don't want to admit our own frailty. 
We don't really want to admit how weak we are. We don't want to admit just how needy we are. We think wrongly, but we think that asking for help means admitting defeat. We don't really want to accept our frailty because we don't really want to accept the limitations that come with it, that come with our weakness, that come with our need. We don't want to, we don't want to believe that this limits us in any way. We, we still want to hold on to that, that hope, that faith, that, that we can do anything we set our mind to. And we don't want to admit that there are some things that we just can't do. Right? We don't want to admit that, that we'll never be that sports star or that, uh, that pop music sensation. We don't want to admit that, that fame and fortune are not going to come into our lives. We don't want to admit that, that these limitations are ours. We don't want to admit just how in need we are. Because with the frailty and with the limitations, what ends up happening is we start making excuses. Oh, this is why this didn't happen, or this is why this didn't happen. Why something ended the way it did. You realize, of course, I think we all need to realize that there's no such thing as the self-made man. There's no such thing as the self-made woman. Right? All of us have help. All of us got help. And there's always others around, right? I mean, there's no such thing as an athlete who's just entirely self-made, right? There's always coach, physical trainer, help, assistance, you know, nutrition. There's all this kind of support. There's all this kind of help, right? It's the parents who drove them to the gym at 5 a.m. every morning. Right? There's no such thing as the self-made athlete. There's no such thing as a self-made business leader. It's always the, the support staff, the people who organize, the people who get things done. Nobody does this by themselves. There's always other people around. None of us can truly make it on our own. All of us have to admit we're frail. We're in need. We have limitations. And the cross shows us this. I mean, Beyond all comprehension, Jesus is weak. Jesus is in need. Jesus' body is absolutely failing. He used to be this never-ending supply, and now he's thirsty. But here's the paradox. Here's this very strange thing that happens in this story. He's weak. He's, his body is failing. He needs help. And yet, and yet, he is completely in control. Here, the passage where this story is found is in John chapter 19. It begins this way. We often forget this part of the story, but here's how this story begins, or here how's this, this little statement, this little saying of Jesus, how it begins. It begins, so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Like, like in our previous session, Jesus is fulfilling prophecy here, Right? Before he was fulfilling prophecy from Psalm 22. Now he's fulfilling prophecy from Psalm 69. Here's Psalm 69 verses 1 to 3. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come to the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. Here's the, here's the prophecy. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. So here's kind of the interesting story about this scene, the saying of Jesus. Is Jesus thirsty or is he in control? Is, is his body weak, failing, frail, in need, or is Jesus just fulfilling prophecy and directing things according to his own authority over them? The answer, of course, is both, right? It's both. We think, wrongly again, we think it's defeatist to admit your frailty. It's defeatist to admit your limitations. You're not supposed to make excuses. And yet, it's only when we are truly in need, to the point where we're utterly dependent, when we're utterly dependent on God's will and God's power, that we find strength that we find power, that we find life. On the cross, 
Christ is weak, Christ is needy with us so that we might find our strength with him. Psalm 63 says this, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Israelites knew about desert climates and looking for, longing for a well, an oasis, a place to supply their needs. Jesus is that for us, right? We live in our, the desert of our limitations. We live in the desert of our frailty. And yet Jesus can be for us the well that never runs dry. Paul, Paul understood this. The Apostle Paul knew this and recognized that all the moments in his life when he was most in need was when God worked so powerfully through him not just for him, but for other people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, starting with verse 7, Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh that he had, this area of weakness. And we're not really quite sure what it was. Was it, was it a, a bad relationship, somebody that tormented them? Was it a health problem that he suffered from? But whatever it was, it was this area of frailty. It was this area of weakness that he had. And he pleaded with God over and over to remove this. Remove my this limitation in my life. But here's what he writes there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, but God said to Paul, my power, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He delighted in his weaknesses because of the opportunities it gave him to serve. The opportunities it gave him to minister, to do something that only God could do through him. He delighted in that, that time he spent a night in a Philippian prison, right? Because it meant that he'd have the opportunity the next day to witness to the Philippian jailer and to his whole family and to bring them to Christ. He delighted in being the center of a mob, right? And, and the, the people in Jerusalem are, are up in arms about Paul and about what he's done and who he is. And he delights in that because it gives him an opportunity to tell the story of his conversion again. He even delighted in being shipwrecked if it meant he got to minister and heal the sick in a place like Malta. We should not be afraid of our limitations because they are opportunities for God to do exceedingly more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that's at work in us. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. God can do immeasurably, immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine if we understand that our strength comes from him and we rely on him, we're dependent on him for all of the strength that we need. So here's your simple little exercise uh, for this session. It's simple, but uh, it can get a little intense. We do this with uh, some of our students in spiritual formation classes at Ozark Christian College. Um, and this is how we guide them. We, we tell them that they, they need to stand in front of a mirror and look at yourself. Have a little notepad or a little journal and just write down everything you see. You know, you may start writing down some good things, some things that you kind of like about yourself, some things you kind of like about your appearance, the things you kind of like about the way you look, who you are. But over time, you're going to notice all of the flaws. You're going to notice all the limitations, all the weaknesses, all the frailty. You're going to notice them all and just go with that. Just write, just write them all down. Get them all out. Be totally honest with who you are. Pour it all out. And then when, once you finish that, okay, now look at yourself from God's point of view. Look at, look at yourself as, as somebody who is completely and utterly dependent on him for strength for wisdom, 
for love, for service. Look at yourself as somebody who, who needs his strength to do the, the, the difficult things he's asking you to do, to forgive and serve and to show compassion and be hospitable to people. And look at all of those limitations. This is what's really hard. Look at all of these limitations as opportunities for God to work through you because you can trust him. See, see all of these limitations as, as ways in which you can show your dependence on God, or how you can make your life a sacrifice for him, how he can use your frailty, your weakness, your limitations for his glory. You think back through scripture and you think about the kinds of people that God used, people like Jacob and Moses and David and Elijah and Peter and Paul and all of them come with baggage. Some of it a lot worse than others, but all of them come with baggage. All of them came with their frailty, with their weakness, with their limitations. And maybe the reason God chose all of these people, choose all stars, maybe the reason God chose them is so that he'd get the glory at the end of the day. Jesus is weak with us. On the cross, suffering, bleeding, in anguish, his life pouring out. Jesus was weak with us so that we can be strong in him. The one who fed 5,000 people and promises to make streams of living water flow out of you is providing all you need for your discipleship journey. He's providing every single thing you need to follow him, his disciples, in the way of the cross. Mm -hmm.